So I've got a bit of an intro here that I normally do, but that's pretty much well nailed it. Um, oh, I'm also a certified Scrum Master, and I do a little bit of Agile coaching as well. Um, so yeah, if you um, are interested afterwards, um, basically all the stuff that I do is on the back of my business card, so if you uh, shout me a beer, then I'll give you a business card. Um, so I also volunteer my skills um, to set up uh, systems for anti-child trafficking volunteers to keep them invisible on the internet. And I run a couple of information security conferences in New Zealand. Um, if you've got any questions afterwards that I don't have time to ask or you want my slide deck or anything like that, just jump on me on Twitter, just follow me, I'll ask some questions on Twitter. Um, and also, I'm always keen to have evaluations. I've I normally have an evaluation link there, but I took it off because I hear they've got it on the app, so please do so. Um, so uh, the Christchurch Hacker Conference, this is their, um, or our, our banner. Uh, this is a conference that I set up with uh, uh, three other individuals um, in Christchurch, and we just ran this on November the 13th, and we had a training on the day before that, and it'll be running again next year. So this is a conference for information security professionals and developers trying to basically get better at doing security and pulling security into their uh, sprints and that sort of thing. Uh, I also run the OWASP New Zealand Day each year in, in Auckland along with two others uh, and hold uh, regular meetups in Christchurch. The other leaders hold them in Auckland and Wellington. Um, I've also run a couple of trainings at the two last uh, KiwiCons um, and they're based on my uh, book series as well. Um, and so the reason I'm involved with running these conferences is because they subscribe to the same ethos that my company does, and this is my company logo. So design, build and break. When most of us think of this, we think of design, build and basically quality or testing, but uh, to me it's a lot more than that. It's, uh, that's where the security aspect comes in, in the breaking part. So, so my idea is to pull this into every sprint. So all the detail is taken from... All the detail in this talk is taken from the first volume of my book. That's why I've got the other two uh, greyed out. So for all the detail, just grab a copy. I've, uh, I've got a link up there. It's on LeanPub. Uh, LeanPub.com slash B for bundle and slash holistic infosec for web developers. So, and you can also read it online for free. So each of the topic chapters are within the book, which is what you basically see up there. Um, so these topic chapters are physical, uh, people, VPS, network, cloud, web applications, mobile, and IoT. Uh, use a threat modeling approach that Bruce Schneier came up with uh, called the sensible security model. I've used the same model as a starting point, and then for each area we zoom into, we iterate on the same model. I use the sensible security model as a guideline or abstraction that encompasses uh, some other well-known threat modeling approaches plus my own. So I often get um, asked why start at the 30,000 foot view. So developers spend most of their time focusing on code, architecture and patterns and we get blind spots and tunnel vision and that sort of thing. So by starting at the 30,000 foot view and coming back to it regularly we get to recalibrate and a focus on what the business priorities are and what the business needs are. So stepping back allows your peripheral vision to kick in. Security will never be done but your security focused product backlog items can be. By stepping back, we make sure we're focusing on the lowest hanging fruit first. There's little point in diving into memory corruption our faults if we're sending our credentials over the wire in plain HTTP. Or even easier, a disgruntled employee that already has a lot of information that just needs to elicit that last uh, crucial piece via a phone call. So we establish teams with the following people types. So to most of us in here, this should look pretty familiar. It's a scrum team, right? So... This team's made up of cross-functional, self-organising individuals with all competencies needed to accomplish the work. This team is all we need in order to blue team successfully as well. So blue teaming in security speak is defending, and that's our developing team, development team. So now we have our team. Let's discuss the threat modelling approach that our team will use every sprint that runs through the entire book. So first we start with asset identification. There's no point in coming up with security solutions without first understanding what you're trying to protect. What are your assets? What's actually important to you and your business? So this will be different for every business. It could be sensitive information in a data store, 
or file system, system resources, customer or employee identities, business intellectual property, uh, developer wikis, GitHub accounts, uh, reputation. So here we create a team box time exercise. Uh, sorry, a team based time box, time boxed exercise in which we identify and write down the assets for your organisation. Then we move into the risk identification section. So as part of identifying your risks, you need to establish who your threat agents and opponents are. These could be other businesses, insiders, opportunists or targeted attacks, and many others. So adopting the mindset of your opponents and attackers will help you work out what they're after and thus what your assets are. How might your threat agents gain access? So there's a lot of common ground between yourself and your adversaries. You've got competing organisations, employees, ex-employees, contractors, operational maintenance personnel, telcos, ISPs, professional services, and many others. So at this point in the book, we run through a large collection of factors that need to be considered in evaluating the risks. We create a time box team exercise in which we identify and write down the risks to the assets for your organisation. At this point, you'll be starting to know your assets and understand the risks to them. I cover formulas like this to help identify the risks to the things that matter to you and your organisation. This helps us apply a rating to each risk. Then we move into the countermeasures section. And this is where you work through collaboratively are creating countermeasure product backlog items. So countermeasure PBIs are like any other PBI. They're estimatable, independent, testable, testable. They should promote collaboration and they must fit within a sprint by the time they're properly groomed. In fact, these are starting to sound like user stories, right? So your countermeasure product backlog items also need to reference the risk that they were created due to, thus providing context and urgency information. So here we create a team boxed, sorry, a time boxed team exercise in which we create countermeasure product backlog items for your organisation, integrate them into the product backlog, and then order them based on the risk ratings. This way what you decide to fix first will be decided by the highest scoring risks. Then we move into the risks that the solution causes section. There'll be new risks that the countermeasures introduce. <coughs> what are they? I'll help you work this out, and I, do, I go through all this in the book. So often, in, often commercial encryption software uh, have services, uh, sorry, often commercial encryption software and services have backdoors for the likes of um, in, uh, uh, the NSA and the US uh, Cyber Command, and basically especially from larger vendors. <coughs> so using public domain open source encryption software that has to be compatible with other implementations rather than proprietary implementations whose backdoors are far less likely to be discovered is one idea. Other new risks of lesser weight than the mitigated risks. Often you'll have to provide extra code for the security solutions. And this, this extra code is extra code that can go wrong and has to be tested. So here we create a time boxed team exercise in which we brainstorm the risks that the, that the countermeasures may introduce and modify the product backlog items as necessary. And then finally we move into the uh, costs and trade-off section. How much are you prepared to give up in order to get the job done? You need to establish the value of your assets and weigh the loss of them against the cost of the security implementation. So there's often a loss of convenience incurred also. You need to be able to measure and be prepared for this. If it's a product you're trying to get to market, it may take you longer to get it there, even though once it's there, it's more likely to stay there. And this is why the team structure we set up at the uh, beginning is important for delivering the sprint increment. Crypto and many other uh, security solutions incur performance penalties. In the case of passwords, this is a benefit. In the case of HTTPS, not so much. So here we create a time, bo time boxed team exercise in which we brainstorm the costs and the trade-offs and modify the product backlog items as necessary. At this point, uh, you'll have a high level view of what your business needs. We can take the learnings and apply them to specific areas, and that's the topic chapters. So returning to the 30,000 foot view as needed to help refocus uh, and recalibrate. We start to focus on the lowest hanging fruit first, as ordered in the product backlog. Again, security will never be done, but our security-focused product backlog items can be. As you learn more based on this empirical threat modelling process, you can start to build a better picture of how your security stature looks. 
And this needs to be reflected in your product backlog. So we use free and open source tools throughout the book. And I built up a customized uh, Kali, Kali Linux installation. And also run a half day, full day, and multi day training um, uh, with many hands on attack and defense exercises. Uh, then we move into the processes and practices chapter. So this is what we see. Um, yeah. So we've got this processes and practices chapter. And we've got penetration testing subsection, which is basically um, a subsection getting the developer and the team ready for how attackers are going to attack their world and helping to understand how the attackers think. Shows them the tooling that they use and the techniques. So your basic, um, your basic um, processes in here and in, uh, within here, I basically just step through um, a whole lot of hands-on exercises. And then from that, uh, from those learnings, we come up with a set of um, agile development processes and practices that we insert into our Scrum process. So attackers are going to be, um, so attackers focus, and attackers focus is to exploit uh, you for profit in your business, and the developers focus is to deliver features. Really are developers thinking about how their worlds are going to be attacked. So you need to understand how your attackers think and work and beat them to your vulnerabilities and remove them before they exploit them. So in the training and the book, we work through many hands-on exercises uh, to give you a really good idea of how they're going to attack your world. Now, a typical attack process may go something like this. Starting with reconnaissance. This is the act of information gathering. The quieter this is done, the less likely suspicions will be raised and defences. We use a lot of open source intelligence techniques. Now, there's a really good book uh, uh, by Michael Bazile. Um, that's his website as well. The book's like about yay thick. Well, actually, he's got several books. Um, and his website's excellent for, um, for working out how much open source intelligence you're actually leaking on the internet. So the idea is to go and find out how much open source is on your organisation or on you on the internet and, and start to remove it or diffuse it. Um, and basically, so basically you're, be you're beating the attacker to his own game. And uh, so Michael Bazile, he's got a bunch of tools on his website uh, that you can use it. Uh, he's also the technical uh, director, I think, of Mr. Robot, which is a very realistic um, hacker series, which some of you may have seen. Um, so here we want to gather as much information that will be potentially useful for taking into the following stages. Then we move into the vulnerability scanning stage, which focuses on finding vulnerabilities. So it's really important to have done a good job at the gathering information uh, stage, otherwise you'll be scratching around and you end up uh, going back to the reconnaissance stage anyway. Attackers are going to be focus on the, are focusing on the lowest hanging fruit first. That's what we need to be focusing on as well. So we start off with options that are as passive as possible uh, to avoid triggering alarms with uh, IDSs and savvy sysadmins. Nmap and scripts can tell us a lot, even when they're configured to scan really quietly. These are just a couple of options that I really enjoy and uh, like using. So uh, basically what these do, um, it makes it look on the network as if a scan is coming from many hosts and, and whereas actual fact the scan is only coming from a single host. So it, it, it just makes it really hard to work out where the scan's actually um, originated from because it's coming from many. Of course, you've got to make sure those hosts are actually up. Uh, Metasploit provides the ability to scan many services. Last time I counted, there was over 450 scanners. These are just the SSH ones. We've got the Open Vulnerability Assessment System, also known as, uh, known as OpenVAS, which scans pretty much everything against known vulnerabilities. It's quite noisy, but it's fine for testing your own systems. Uh, you drive it with a command line interface and a web application. And it covers the OWASP top 10, and number five's Security misconfiguration, number seven, missing function level access uh, control, or formerly known as failure to restrict URL access. And number nine, using components with known vulnerabilities, which is becoming quite a big one now. 
And we've got OWASP Zap, which I discuss soon, and many others throughout the book. So at this stage, a penetration tester or a defender will have a good idea of which vulnerabilities should be attempted to be exploited. And you need to start hunting for exploits that are actually going to work on your defects. Offensive security, that's the creators of Kali Linux, have the exploit database. It's a link to it, which is a web front end, which looks a little bit like this, has um, our thousands of exploits in there. And a command line interface. This one's in Kali Linux. And we've got security focuses bug track. We've got Rapid7, which is the current owner of Metasploit. They also have a database. We've got the node security advisories and the national vulnerability database. And we've got Threat Crawler, uh, which Chris uh, Campbell created, which aggregates as many advisories together as he can get his hands on. Uh, Chris runs the Christchurch Hacker Conference with me. So the idea here is you can just use Threat Crawler and it uh, uses all the other advisories. And then the exploitation stage, I cover a little a bit of that in, in here, but most of it's um, throughout the rest of the topic chapters. So then we take what we've learned from the red team and create a set of development-related processes and practices. Now these development-related processes and practices are fully documented in my book, and that's what we're seeing here. We then apply the development-related processes and practices to your scrum team, also known as uh, uh, the blue team or uh, uh, your development team. And by taking what we've learned from the red team and empowering and educated the blue team, or your development team, by bringing the security focus from late in the software development lifecycle to within each sprint as part of your definition of done, we augment your scrum process with security focused processes and practices. So on the left is the additional security focused processes and practices uh, that I like to add, and on the right we have your scrum events, artifacts and transparency. So by doing this, we drastically reduce the cost of finding not just security defects, but all defects. This is the average cost of, fo of fixing defects based on when they're introduced versus when they're detected. So putting the practices, that's finding the defects in the right order, can reduce total project cost by up to 100 times. This is out of um, Steve McConnell's uh, Code Complete. So, so what we're seeing here, right, is if, I say a requirements defect is found in post-release, it'll cost you 10 to, t 10 to 100 times to fix it as it would as if it was fixed when it was introduced. And we get the same sort of thing happening in the architecture and construction going on down here. So this is just a graph for the same thing. So the idea is detect faults at the stage where they're the least time consuming and costly to correct. So we've got handcrafted penetration testing. This is costly when performed late in the cycle, but many times cheaper when performed within each sprint. There's lots of guidance on how to do this in my book. We've also got BSIM, OWASP, Microsoft and Intel have loads of resources on this, which I also reference in the book. You can establish a security champion. Now a security champion is a bit like a scrum master in that they are a servant leader, but with the relevant security skills. Find someone that really enjoys technical challenges and don't push the role onto them, but let them pull the role, you, because you want good buy-in, right? And mandating roles generally doesn't work very well. So offer it up there and let them pull the role on. So the security champion will be able to bring change to within the team and the organisation. We've got peer programming. Two brains on your code is, are not just twice as good as one, especially when one is a security focus. Code reviews. You can augment your usual code review process, with the likes of JS linting uh, tools as part of your build and source control pre-commit, if you're not already doing this. And there's a collection of static and dynamic analysis tools listed in my book that you can also automate. So we cover techniques for asserting discipline in inherently undisciplined languages, such as JavaScript. So we discuss um, offerings such as Flow and TypeScript, which give us um, static type checking and uh, which are essentially the implementation of design by contract, or DBC, which is an architectural principle. So when you usually run your test condition workshop, or when the developer pulls a product a backlog item into work in progress, Joe's probably seen this, uh, you start thinking about what types of testing are going to be the most suitable. 
and developers create test conditions. I was going to explain this, but because this is an agile conference, there's no need to. So they also create evil test conditions, which are just the same as test conditions, but they have a security focus. And this is where the likes of your security champion can sit with the developers, because often developers are not thinking about how their worlds can be attacked, whereas um, your security um, mentor um, can sit with them and help them basically think about how their worlds are going to be attacked and yeah, come up with security-focused uh, test conditions. So traditionally, penetration testing is performed at the end of the project. Unbelievably, often once the solution is de delivered. Imagine if you did this with any other form of QA. Can we actually see that? Yeah, it is hard. Uh, yeah, so what we've got is um, we've got basically se um, security defect uh, found uh, via traditional external penetration testing. And most of us have probably seen this curve. Um, so that's the most expensive place up there to actually uh, uh, fix your defects. And as we can see, we've got all these uh, lovely things here which give us a uh, code quality here. But there's no, there's no sign of security there. And the reason it's so expensive, right, finding your defects up here, right, is because it could be uh, days, weeks, months, even years since the defect was introduced. Um, your developers may have left and basically if the developers are still around when, uh, when you find that defect at the end, uh, they've basically, you know, they've got to, in many cases, take hours or even days to get back to the point where they've loaded up the layers of code in their head and worked out what any change is going to affect through the rest of the system. So, you know, it could take a day just to get back to that place for every bug. So by converting that effort to something that can be used in parallel with development, we significantly reduce the costs and lift the quality. So we're basically bringing um, most of the work that's done at the end down into here. And um, so we're going to look at... Um, we're going to look at security regression testing with uh, a Zap API and NodeGo. So these two tools, we've got two tools here, right? We've got... They're both, they're both o, OWASP projects. So we've got OWASP um, a Zap API here on the left, which has a RESTful um, interface as well, so you can program against it. It has a large collection of exploits and, and known vulnerabilities that those exploits target. Uh, we've got NodeGoat. Uh, I've worked on both of these a little bit. I've worked on, well, I'm a core contributor to NodeGoat. So a NodeGoat is also an OWASP project. It covers the OWASP top 10. It's got a um, collection of tutorials that helps the person working with it find uh, where the defects are in its application. So it's a purposely vulnerable node app. And it, it basically discusses uh, the defects and helps you work out what the fixes are for them. So um, all I've done here is I've written a test for NodeGoat uh, that hits OWASP and tells OWASP Sorry, that hits um, the Zap API and tells the Zap API to start testing it. Um, so Zap can also be run headless. Um, it's also got a, a Docker image and NodeGoat. I've just created a Docker image uh, for it as well, so you can run these in a uh, nightly build. I'm just going to mirror screens now because I'm going to uh, walk through a demo. Okay, so I'm going to show you how this actually, oh no, just before I show you how it works, I'm just going to show you a little bit of the, uh, the code, uh, the, or, the, uh, or that, uh, the actual test. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit too bright in here, isn't it?
Okay, so I'm not going to show you too much of it, but this is the actual test. So this test here is testing just the profile route in the node Goat application that I'm going to show you soon. So basically this test could be used, uh, could be pretty much just written once as it is and just um, pass in different parameters. It's not set up to do this yet. This is a proof of concept. But you could, part, um, you could do um, a little bit of modification and just pass in uh, the route that you want tested. So you would only have to write this once. So what we've got here is we've got some, uh, we've got some Selenium WebDriver uh, code happening here. So what this does is it pops open the browser, it, um, it navigates to the profile route, and then we populate these fields here, these fields here with these values, and then we submit that request to Zap, and that uh, builds up the sites tree in Zap, so Zap now knows what our application looks like, and then it can um, start thinking about testing it, uh, we've also got um, this alert threshold. This alert threshold here, uh, currently set to three. So the hypothetical scenario here is that you've got a development team that's taken on this Brownfields project. It's currently got three defects, and you want it to pass the first time so that you can basically get moving. And then you can go back and fix those defects and then basically reduce that number. So that's what that's for. Uh, and then we've got the succinct series, which does most of the work. Also, uh, yeah, so this is using um, JavaScript. Uh, it's using uh, the Mocha uh, test library. Uh, we've got the succinct series here. Which, so all these functions in here, apart from the very last one, educate Zap what it needs to know in order to log into NodeGoat. Uh, we supply the credentials, we force it to log in, and we do a few other things basically that just are set it up uh, to be able to log in and force it log in. And then we've got this active scan, which is the actual uh, high-level scan that uh, we tell uh, Zap to do. And of course, all we're doing here is we're actually just so we're programming against OWASP using uh, the client. So it's actually pretty simple stuff. And this, yeah. And then we've got uh, so this here is basically just uh, uh, just some completion stats that uh, we pull the API, and then it tells us how far through the scan we are. And then we basically uh, tell Zap to, uh, uh, to write a report for us. And this is just giving it a, um, a name, basically, date, time, name. So let's have a look at how this works. OK, so what we've got is we've got Zap here. Oh, this is a Zap UI. It's sitting behind all this other stuff. It can be on a different machine. It can be in a container. It can be anywhere. It doesn't matter. You'll see the sites tree gets built up as soon as, um, as, soon as we start the test. This is um, where NodeGoat lives. It's living at 56.1 port 4000 at the moment. So what we do to start with is we reset the database to a, a clean known state. We start the, um, a node go. And then we just run the test. So this will pop open the um, Selenium, uh, the Selenium web driver pops open uh, the uh, Chrome web browser, populates the fields, sends those off. You see the sites tree built up, and when then we Educate Zap what it needs to know in order to start testing our application. Then we kick off the active scan, and you can see we're getting results here come back um, on the completion state. So, as you can see, that's a failed test. So, if we look at what it's actually told us, so it says it's. Uh, so we're finishing scan zero. Please see the report for further details. I was about to write a report. Writing report two tells us where it's written report two. Search the generated report for profile to see the seven vulnerabilities that exceed the user-defined threshold of three. So a developer's come in and he's introduced seven defects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we do what it tells us. And this is the report that uh, 
the, the Zap API created for us. So I've searched for that profile route here. So it gives us um, some generic information about what the XSS defect is. It tells us um, uh, the parameter name, the type of attack that it used, and enough information to actually go and read Gent um, to recreate the attack. And there's your seven uh, vulnerabilities there. And then down below it, we've just got the uh, three existing. So this, ideally, if you've got it in a nightly build, uh, the developer will come in in the morning and realise basically immediately that he's broken something. So in this case, you can browse to where your NodeGoat app's running from and then to the slash tutorial slash A3 route. And in there, you've um, got directions on how to fix the cross-site scripting uh, defect. But the idea is to swap out your app for NodeGoat. OK, so he's fixed, he's fixed his um, defects. And of course, it's all, um, the context's already in his head. He doesn't have to spend hours or a day to actually get back to that point. So it's, it's really cheap. So we reset the database. We start the application again. And then we run the test again. Same process. Okay, so that's a, that's a passing test. Okay, and it gives us enough information there. Um, we can go and have a look at that report, but I'm actually just going to um, move on because I'm a little bit behind. But, but you get the idea. Okay, so, so here you go about setting this up for your own team. Remember, this is just a proof of concept. I've ha I have gone on and implemented it for um, a, a large international uh, client, but this one's just a proof of concept. So um, how to set this up is in my book and also on my GitHub. Okay, so, so usually we'd cover the physical chapter here. <laughs> uh, but there's not enough time. So... So this is where the topic chapters start, and we get we use everything we've learned up until um, now on those topic chapters. So the most commonly exploited vulnerabilities are actually in people. As a development team, we identify and record our people assets. People carry huge amounts of intellectual property on their devices, on their peripherals, and in their heads. We also leak it really easily. So much of the open source intelligence uh, gathering that a penetration test will do is from employees leaking. So these assets could be things like employee state of mind, engagement, loyalty, and many others. And I cover all these in the book. So as we discuss the risks in the 30,000 foot view chapter, this is where the, we do the same but focused on the people risks. The following is a small subset of some of the risks in my book. So we take the um, IP from a target organisation simply by offering their employees a better deal. And some of us may know what this one's going to be about, what this is going to look like. All right. That's right, I don't have speakers, damn it. Okay, so this is Mr. Robot. Uh, what's happening here is uh, they're offering him a job. Uh, this is Evil Corp, which is like, um, oh, they've got, what is it, 70% of the uh, world's credit card and something or other else. So basically they're offering him a contract, um, but it's in secret. So they're trying to poach him, right? He's going to make him a multi-millionaire a within the next five years. What do you say? So Eric's an engaged, um, loyal employee. So what does he say? Can I think about it?
So treating your employees as you would like to be treated yourself goes a long way towards mitigating this. There are quite a few other um, mitigation uh, techniques in my book as well. Okay, so I'm going to show you how easy it is to profile someone with a weak password strategy. Uh, we're going to be profiling Bob the Builder's uh, password with the common user password profiler, also known as CUP, and then feeding the generated word list to our brute forcing tool, Hydra, in this case. So I've got quite a number of um, other uh, password profiling tools and brute forcing tools documented in uh, basically how to use them and that sort of thing in my book. So I'm just going to mirror screens here again for this one. Cool. So we're just going to have a look at the um, CUP configuration file for starters, because that's what drives it, that's what makes the common user password profiler um, its decisions. So this is leap mode. This allows us to swap characters for numbers and numbers for characters, because a lot of people think that um, if you change those sorts of things around, then the attackers are not going to be able to guess your passwords, right? Here we can add some special characters, any special characters that we want that we think that, the, um, uh, that Bob may have used. And we can add some random years. These um, are good for anniversaries and birth dates and that sort of thing. And some random numbers. And the word length shaping. So this is, um, yeah, so this is um, the size words that we want in our word list. So in this case, it's from 5 to 12 characters long. And then we've got this uh, a threshold here. So this is a complexity setting. The more we hike that up, the um, the longer the word list is, and the more complex the passwords. So now we're going to take um, CUP for a drive in interactive mode, or as I like to call it, interview mode, because the tool actually interviews you. And all this information we feed in now um, is, is, is gathered from the reconnaissance step. So we had his nickname, we had his birth date, we had his par uh, a partner's name and nickname. Of course, you cut. You can customise these questions if you want to go in there and change the code. It's open source. Uh, her birth date, his child's name, his child's uh, nickname. Now, all the different profiling tools are actually quite different. Some are very scientific and others are sort of more touchy-feely like this. And you can use multiple of them if you want to get um, nice short uh, word lists. So, yeah, Bob's uh, hypothetical dog's name, Spot. And his company name, Bob Buildings. Now, do we want to add some uh, keywords about the victim? Yep, so the idea is here that is that you add keywords, it strips out the spaces, and you just put a comma between the phrases or the words. So can we fix it? Yes, we can. So do we want to add special characters at the end? Yep. Uh, and no random numbers this time around. Uh, and yep, we want to use leap mode. So that's created our word list. Let's have a look at it. So as we scroll through it, um, you'll notice uh, the types of words that it's created based on the input and how it's swapped characters for numbers and numbers for characters are using the leap mode. Yeah, so the next step is to educate our brute forcing tool what an unsuccessful login looks like, so that when it gets something else, it knows that it's a successful login. Uh, you can do it the other way around, but this is the easiest way to do it. So usually the easiest way to do this is to set up a dummy account on the website or a web app uh, that your target lives or has an account on. So we just turn on Foxy Proxy, which um, directs our traffic to a specific port. Then we fire up Burp Suite, which is another HTTP intercepting proxy, a little bit like OWASP's app. 
And we're going to enter a, uh, the correct username of user uh, with an incorrect password of incorrect pass. And then fire that off. And we catch it in our burp, and then we uh, send it to the intruder tab because we want to replay it, but with some different parameters. Now you can see we're using a tech type of sniper there in here. So basically all we're interested in is uh, substituting uh, the password. All these others here we just clear out. If we're wanting to um, substitute the password and say uh, the username, then we'd use uh, cluster bomb. So we just clear out those substitutions that Burp's put in for us. And now we're going to add some uh, passwords for those substitutions. So we're going to add uh, user1, user2, user3, which are all incorrect passwords. And then finally user, which is the correct password for our dummy account. And the idea here is we're going to fire off these four requests plus the original. And then we want to have a look at the response and see the difference in the response from the uh, single correct password to the four incorrect ones. And then that difference of the incorrect one is what we feed to our brute forcing tool. So the difference is here. So a correct one gives us an index.php, an incorrect one gives us a login. So we take the login.php and feed it to our brute forcing tool. Okay, so here's our command that we build up down here. So we've got, an, um, we've got a lowercase l there for the, uh, for the username. If, if we had a word list for the username as well, we'd use an uppercase l. Uh, we've got the P for the uh, password or the word list that we're going to feed to it. Uh, we're hitting the OWASP broken web app, this guy here, and we're doing an HTTP form post, and this is our actual uh, request. We're going to be substituting the up arrow, pass up arrow, with each uh, word from the word list, and the up arrow, user up arrow, uh, gets substituted just with Bob each time. And that's what we're looking for as our incorrect uh, response. And just V for a little bit of verbosity. Okay, so we started that off. Now I miss from 3,100 here up to f about 14,000 just to save us some time. Now, the reason this is so fast is because uh, the, damn vulnerable, the damn vulnerable web app is using an MD5 hashing scheme, uh, which is just, yeah, it's just a hash, right? There's no uh, key derivation function used. So Hydra thinks it's found our password of yes, we can, by the look of it. So we just copy that uh, username in and copy the password in and see if, we, see if it's successful. Okay. Okay, so that's successful. So some learnings here. Uh, there's no lockout. So the lockout needs to be a balance uh, between security and usability. Uh, the lockout, you want to lockout account after three to five incorrect attempts. You want to lock the account for a short duration, say three to five minutes or even less. Um, you know, I mean, quite a small time there is plenty to slow a brute force attack down because you can see how fast they are if you're not using a decent um, KDF or key derivation function, and then unlock it. Uh, consider deploying a password reset after five to 10 lockouts. 
and be careful not to um, a, a denial of service or DOS legitimate users like the Microsoft Membership API actually does. Uh, use the correct KDF for your expected attackers and maturity requirements. And uh, tune the key stretching uh, using the OWASP recommendations. So there's a few KDFs here um, that we can look at. Um, each one was um, created to uh, resist brute force attacks of the hardware of the day. So we, I started out with PB uh, KDF2 in the early, early to mid 90s. So this um, was CPU intensive only. It was easily uh, parallelized on GPUs and ASIC chips and uses little RAM. And then in 1999, uh, we came up, well, we didn't, uh, but Bcrypt came along uh, using Bruce Schneier's X Blowfish Cipher. So this has a requirement for um, a far greater RAM, uh, and it's harder to parallelize on GPUs and ASIC chips. And then Scrypt, which was uh, maintained from 2009 to 2015, which diffuses attacks utilizing field programmable gate arrays and GPUs. So FPGAs became more popular. So, but now we've got CPUs with many cores like the Xeon Phi, uh, which has uh, six, uh, just under 60 usable cores, each with four hardware threads. Um, so now our latest KDF is Argon 2, which has been accepted in July 2015, which provides tunable execution time, tunable memory required, uh, tunable degree of parallelization, and resists side channel attacks. So the idea there is to um, work out which KDF is going to suit you, but make sure you use one of those. Uh, all of this is discussed in my book as well. Okay, so... <laughs> Questions, yeah. Uh, what have we got? Okay, so I've got one more demo here, uh, which is a spear flashing play. So this shows um, a very simple way of obtaining your victim's credentials using the social engineering toolkit. Okay, so there's nothing currently in the public web-facing directory. This is our attacking box. That's our target on the right. So we, so we run the social engineering toolkit. We choose number one, social engineering attacks. We choose number two, website attack vectors. And we choose number three, credential harvester attack. Now the site's clone, yep, yep, so we want a, clo uh, a clone a site. So now we're the, um, are we into the IP address that set listens on in order to capture the key log? And we clone accounts.google.com. Okay, so the host is cloned and we have a PHP file now sitting in our Apache web directory and we start Apache, uh, sorry, set social engineering stalk a toolkit starts Apache, Apache if it's not already running. Now we, uh, now we see the cloned artifacts and the key log file is currently empty. Now the victim clicks a link that was passed to them via social engineering. It's an IP address, but in a later um, demo, which we won't have time for, we spoof the DNS and poison the ARP cache. So this could be any site that you know your victim has credentials for. In this case, the user enters commitpentester.org and my insecure password. And as soon as the victim posts, set uses the HTML referrer header in which it intercepts the request that comes from the victim's IP address and harvests the posted credential fields. And the page redirects to the real accounts.google.com. So it basically leaves the user wondering, well, they don't know that any of this has happened. So the social engineering toolkit provides the ability to craft emails with, sp uh, with a spoofed from address. You just need to... In um, uh, to install and configure SendMail. Cheers. <laughs>